This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and this is the Dell Latitude 5491, which you might even assume, and you would be correct in guessing that this replaces the 5490 that came before it. This is a very interesting, if not odd, 14-inch business laptop or Ultrabook, because, well, we see plenty of 14-inch business laptops in unassuming black, you know, with lots of ports, all that sort of thing. You would expect a great keyboard, a very good trackpad, but inside of here, instead of the usual Ultrabook 15-watt quad-core CPUs Intel 8th generation that you would see in just about everything, the ThinkPad T480, everything else that Dell makes pretty much in the business class and this size, this one has 45-watt up to six core mobile workstation CPUs. So that's the same Intel Coffee Lake CPUs you'd see in the XPS 15, our gaming laptop, all that sort of thing. But in a 14 inch package, that's relatively speaking, pretty thin and pretty light. It's under an inch thick, 22.8 millimeters. Who is this for? We're gonna find out now. So at 1.65 kilograms, which is 3.63 pounds, this thing is as light as any competing 14-inch business Ultrabook. It doesn't look too skinny from the sides, but, you know, it's less than an inch thick. It's not one of those super slim Ultrabooks like an X1 Carbon or an XPS 13 even. But given the horsepower inside, that's fair. There's no way you're going to cram a 6-core CPU or even the 4-core 45-watt Core i5 8300H option that's also available. You can get this with the Core i5 or Core i7, again, 45-watt mobile workstation CPU all day, all night, all the time. It starts around $1,000. Typical of Dell Latitude business laptops, these things are expensive. I assume that corporate buyers, IT folks work out discounts when they buy in volume. Of course, Dell always has all sorts of coupons, but that $1,000 base price gets you a Core i5 and 4 gigs of DDR4 2666 megahertz RAM, so hardly any RAM there. 500 gig, 7200 RPM hard drive. Nobody's going to get excited about a hard drive, but your IT department might foist that upon you to save some money. And the display options are, get ready for it, 1366 by 768 or full HD 1920 by 1080. Both of those display options are available with or without touch. You can buy it either way. And they're not particularly glossy, which is nice. Not full on matte, but not super duper glossy either. So glare is well controlled. Good thing, because these displays aren't bright. We'll talk about that in a bit. Our configuration, which is pretty well maxed out with that Core i7. In fact, it's not the usual 8750H that you see in gaming laptops and that sort of thing. This is an 8850H because that's the vPro version of the CPU. So 100 megahertz faster, a little bit oomph here there. 16 gigs of RAM, a 512 gig NVMe SSD, and that's a Toshiba SSD, the same one Dell uses in Alienware's in the XPS 15. You get the idea, a lot of that stuff. And we have the full HD touchscreen there. And there's also an there's optional LTE 4G with Snapdragon X7 modem if you want. So you go for the, the top of the line kind of stuff there. You're looking at probably around $2,200 or so. So not cheap. But I suppose if you're in that limited market for somebody who is looking for an incredibly powerful CPU in a very small package, maybe it's tempting. Now the graphics, this isn't like a Razor Blade 14 kind of situation here. The, the graphics are either Intel UHD 630 integrated graphics alone, or you can get it switchable via NVIDIA Optimus with NVIDIA MX130 with two gigabytes of GDDR5 VRAM dedicated graphics. That's a very low end dedicated GPU. It is faster than Intel integrated graphics, give you a little extra push if you're doing some video editing or doing some Photoshop, but nothing to write home about. This is not going to really be a gaming choice by any means. So with older games, if you're playing like Skyrim, it will accelerate them a little bit. Okay, so it's a pretty unique laptop. It's a pretty expensive laptop. What are the additional pluses here that might make you want to make the spend? It does have Thunderbolt 3, full 40 gigabit per second. The machine has ports on both sides and on the rear. It's a business laptop, so this has some of those creature comforts I know some of you missed. Lots of ports. We even have gigabit Ethernet on here. We have three USB-A 3.1 ports. You've got HDMI. That's USB-C port on the side. can handle display port out. You have an SD card slot. You have a smart card reader because this is a business laptop. So they're going to have business security features like Dell has hard drive encryption and the fingerprint scanner on the, key, on the keyboard deck and optional Windows Hello IR camera as well, in addition to that smart card reader. So we've got plenty of security on board here for business buyers. 
The keyboard and the trackpad on this are really nice. I mean, they're going up against ThinkPads and they know it, and those have world-class keyboards and pretty good trackpads. This is a white backlit with two stages, a white backlighting keyboard with really nice travel, good and deep, and with nice tactile feel and spring. It's a real pleasure to type on. And the trackpad, which has the eraser stick nav point style pointer to try to convert you over from ThinkPads, is also very good. So you've got the dedicated buttons on the trackpad as well, which I always enjoy, and they're nice. They're not too stiff. They're not too soft. Works very well. So in terms of performance, as you might guess, this has a lot more CPU, CPU performance than average. Now, probably the average 14-inch business Ultrabook buyer doesn't need massive computational power, but some of you out there just might. Maybe you're buying this and you need to compile very large programs. Maybe you are one of those accounting and finance people who really do do computations on extremely large spreadsheets. That would be for you. The occasional video editing, but the display is going to get in the way of that. We'll talk about the display in a minute. So it has more horsepower than probably a lot of people need. But if you're the kind of person that knows you need an XPS 15 or I've been considering a gaming laptop because you really need the computation, computational power, but you want kind of chill business portability, well, that would be the, the model here for you. The drawback is, is that the fans are louder when they come up because they are physically larger fans for that more powerful CPU that's on board there. So if you're just using it for light productivity work, you're not going to hear the fans. But when they come on, they will fill the room more than teeny little Ultrabook fans ever could. So if you're pushing it hard, you're going to hear the fans. If you're using it, again, for productivity tests, it's going to get warm on the bottom. It's not going to get hot. If you are pushing it hot, hard, it will get quite hot on the bottom, particularly on the left side. So it's not in the in-between section between your legs where you could use it on your lap and ignore it you will feel it. Again, only when you're really pushing it hard. For example, when we're doing benchmarks or we're doing test compiles of code and that sort of thing. In terms of performance, beyond the throttling issue, and you can see when we ran the Firestrike graphics test, which is a pretty demanding graphics test, but then that NVIDIA MX130 does not get very hot. It's not very powerful. Where it throttled pretty much immediately at 99 centigrade, 100 is the allowable maximum. Uh, the only other ding I can give it is that the Toshiba SSD it does not have very fast write speeds for an NVMe SSD. Will you notice this in actual real-world use? Probably not so much, but for specs geeks out there, those of you who look at SSD performance, this one does not have great write speeds. Really good read speeds, though. The display on this is business class atrocity, basically. No, it's not that bad. The 136 by 768 we didn't receive that one for review, but I assume it's not going to be better than the full HD touchscreen, which is the highest end option that you can get here. The brightness on this is astoundingly low. It may set a new record low for brightness for anything we measured at 185 nits. Thank God there's not a lot of glare here. It's fine if we're indoor, soft, office lighting and that sort of thing, but if you're expecting to use this outdoors in vertical market applications like insurance, going out inspecting cars in broad daylight, it's not going to work out well for you. Color gamut is hobbled also. It's it's pretty mediocre. You, we expect to see, once we get into this price range, even for a business laptop where we're pushing $2,000, better color gamut than this. So the very middling color gamut means it's not a great choice for photo editors. And for those of you who are producing videos, hopefully it's just boring corporate videos without, wow, jazzy, beautiful things going on on screen because you're not going to be able to see those represented very accurately with that kind of narrow color gamut. Contrast is good at least. So battery life, 68 watt hour battery inside, which is for an Ultrabook pretty decent. Uh, but for an Ultrabook that happens to have a mobile workstation class CPU, it's not a whole lot. Thankfully, the graphics are not that demanding. You can get a 130 watt charger, which is bigger than your Ultrabook charger, certainly because it has to power the more powerful CPU. And the, the low in NVIDIA graphics as well. So 68 watt hours, it depends on what you do with it. If you're really going to be pushing this hard and make use of that CPU that you're picking up this model for, your battery life is probably not going to be fantastic. It would probably be four to five hours. I mean, I said probably because it really depends on what particular tasks you're using it for. For us, we throw really heavy video editing at at a program compilation, that sort of thing. If you're using it just for kind of everyday business tasks on the go, then you should be able to get seven hours out of it though, which is certainly passable. It does support Dell's Express fast charging and again, ample charger there to do that with. 130 watts is plenty to charge up this system. Taking off the bottom cover means unscrewing the Phillips head screws. These are captive screws, which means they get held inside the cover. You don't have to pull them all the way out. And then prying. There's a little pry point right near the back. You can start with a guitar pick or whatever you've got to pry with to get the bottom off. And that's what the underside looks like with the spray-on metal shielding. And here we have the guts. 
There's our battery, two RAM slots, so that means a maximum of 32 gigs of DDR4 RAM is possible if you went with two 16 gig modules. We have two eights in here for a total of 16 in ours. Here's our Intel Wi-Fi card, 9560AC, latest generation, that is a good card. The fan here is a decent size given the power of the CPU, and that is our heatsink for our CPU, and that's the little heatsink for the NVIDIA MX130 graphics. That heatsink, by the way, is pretty tiny. This is like Ultrabook size, 15 watt CPU size heatsink. Usually you see something beefier with a 45 watt CPU, perhaps. That's why this thermal throttles when you push it really hard. And the single heat pipe is about as little as you can get away with for cooling. SD card slots, what this metal shield is for right here. And if you had the optional 4G LTE, a Snapdragon X7 LTE, LTEA modem, it would go right over here, and the SIM card slot is in the back. That's what this little metal cage is for right there. We have our M.2 PCIe NVMe SSD mounted over here. If you had the hard drive option, the hard drive would fill in this area instead. Tight fit there. There's not much room, honestly, especially given the fact that the backup battery is sitting over there. So that's the Dell Latitude 5491. It's not easy being green, so to speak, being a very oddball laptop, but I'm sure, I guess there's somebody out there that needs this sort of horsepower inside in terms of computing performance. The GPU, nothing to write home about, but in a very ultra portable package. I'm assuming they intended for spreadsheet warriors who deal with thousands and thousands, if not millions of lines in an Excel spreadsheet and doing computations heavy-duty coders, like I said, even ZBrush because that uses the CPU more than the GPU. The challenges are in a chassis this small, well, there's not a lot of room for cooling, so those CPU cores do throttle. They do reach their thermal maximum, so you're still getting more performance than you would out of an Ultrabook. The question is how many people are looking for that in a package this small without the fancy pans and dedicated graphics to go with it, they turn into a weekend gaming laptop and all that sort of thing. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more cool tech videos and thumbs up if you like this vid.